amazing. Well, thank you for coming, for being here tonight. Thank you, Marissa. I'll just die. Uh, thanks for being here. It's exciting to teach the last or second to last. We haven't decided yet. Uh, <laughs> of uh, stuff you ever learned in Hebrew school. Yeah, it's in, it's in discussion. And thank you to everyone who's here in person and to everybody who's going to catch the recording later. You're welcome. And uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about. Oh, we're not going to, well, we obviously, we got, it's going to be kind of ironic, ironic because you're not going to talk about Jews because you're talking about non-Jews. But it's not entirely true because, of course, all of our Jewish text talks about non-Jews in the context of Jews. And as just like a, I don't know how to say it, preemptive strike, just as a, as a warning, I, I'm definitely, we're going to be going over uh, traditional, these are traditional, these are classic texts. So we're going over, it's really Torah. Tosafta Mishnah Talmud. So kind of like birth through the year 500 ish. So very, very, very ancient. I'm not, I, I might pop in with some kind of more modern stuff when it is relevant. And I'm not here to like make people feel bad. I'm here to kind of show you what our tradition approaches, how our tradition approaches non Jews. And what I hope you get out of it, I, I don't have like a, you're gonna get to a point where like, yes, it is all this or all that, because as in, I would say everything really in Judaism, we're, our tradition does not come down, even our classic text does not come down solidly on kind of one side or another. Our, 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 from, our, from the Torah through our rabbis, our sages, our ancient rabbis, they're, they, they are very much so mixed and they have a very dynamic view. And that makes it really interesting to study and very reflective of real life because real life is never lived in the absolutes, I feel like, but somewhere in the middle in the gray. Jennifer's favorite space is the gray. Um, but does make it hard to wrap your mind around because I think our minds like absolutes because they're easy, but they're not realistic. And I think Judaism honors that. So without further ado, um, let's screen share. Multiple windows now. Thank you. Okay. Nope. There we go. Good job, Sarah. So, where did I put you? That's about. Agar Shir Bisharecha, the non Jew who lives among you. And oh, my mom literally texted me, I can't get on the class. Okay, my mom's right now. Sorry. Um, and the non Jew who lives among you and those whom you live among. And this phrase, this is too hot, this is unbelievable. Uh, Gerashir Bishiracha comes from what the hell is that? Uh, it comes from here. Uh, it's called this, I call this Shabbat is for everyone. And see, about Shabbat. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of your God, Adonai, and you shall not do any work. You, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, or your cattle, or the stranger who is within your settlements. And I bolded it because that's the translation of Hebrew, Hebrew, English. You know same. Ger, sherp, bisharech. Like, ger is a weird word. And we like to translate it as stranger, but it always denotes someone who is not Jewish. And specifically, the ger in this phrasing uh, in the Torah is that it is a, is a non Jewish person who lives within your settlements, who lives among you. So, they're, so from the very beginning, from the book of Exodus, from the very beginning of Jews, as long as there have been Jews, we have lived with non-Jews. In this particular case, is there are new non-Jews, not just that, I think we always think of ourselves as we are the minority living amongst a very large non-Jewish majority. And that's true in most countries of the world. But the Torah is presenting us with what's true for, for uh, very few, which is that there are, there's Jews and there are non-Jews who live amongst them. And the other point to take out of this is that so who deserves Shabbat? Who deserves one day off, which is revolutionary if you think about it, like in terms of just human history, the idea that you get a day off. Who gets a day off because of God? You do, your son or daughter, so women named, which never happens, your male or female slave, slaves is wh who aren't really, really considered human beings in most ancient law. Your animals even get a day off and non-Jews, everybody. 
the Torah saying every single person deserves Shabbat, whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, whether you are free or whether you are enslaved, whether you are a human being or whether you are an animal, whether you are a man or a woman, whether you're a child or an adult, everybody deserves Shabbat, included specifically for the purpose of discussion here, non-Jews. Non-Jews deserve Shabbat as well. Anyone has anything to say here, just gonna have to, don't raise your hand, just unmute yourselves. We're all, we're all big girls here. We're all small girls. So let's look at some specific non-Jews, because there are some really specific non-Jews in the Torah. I think if I asked you, tell me about a specific non-Jew in the Torah, you think like, you, you think of, you know, oh, Pharaoh, oh, he was pretty bad, right? You know, he enslaved everybody else pretty bad. But he wasn't the first Pharaoh mentioned in the Torah. We've got this Pharaoh, Liz, why don't you read for us the story of the good Pharaoh, as opposed to that Pharaoh, who was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Come on. I have to finish chewing. Okay. Pharaoh sent for Aram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her as my wife. Now here is your wife. Take her and be gone. And Pharaoh sent him off with his wife and all he possessed. So you've got Avram, who's not Abraham yet, so he's still working the kinks out. And he is with Sarai, his wife, who will later become Sarah. And she's a looker. Apparently, at this point in time, Avram, they've been married for like 100 years or something. I'm exaggerating, but not by much. And he looks over and he'll say, wow, my wife is really good looking. And so they're in land of Egypt, and or in loan by Egypt. And uh, there's this Pharaoh doing what Pharaoh does. And Pharaoh sees this really good looking lady. And he goes, hey, what's your name? Avram says, my name is Avram. And Pharaoh says, that's a really good looking lady. Uh, who is she? And Avram goes, oh no, if I tell him that she's my wife, he'll just kill me and he'll take her. So he's like, oh, she's my sister. And so Pharaoh's like, cool, fair game. Snatches her right up. Pharaoh, after having plagues sent on him by God, precursor, Pharaoh sends for Avram and says like, are you serious? This was your wife? Why'd you lie and say she's your sister? And I took her as a wife. And that's a big no, no, you can never take another man's wife. Water fair and square, no matter what your culture is, Bible and fair and square, she's yours. So, how could you do that? Like, so Pharaoh, who's not Jewish, is mad at Avram for lying and saying this woman, like, he's like, Are you serious? Like, you thought I was going to be a bad person? I'm like, Oh, if he says that, if I say that she's my, my wife, then they'll just kill me. Like, you assume Pharaoh, Pharaoh's like insulted that you would lie. And also, you've He's mad that Avram Pace plays her in this position that he's now being, he could have had, uh, you know, sexual relations with another man's wife. So we have Pharaoh here, in the sense that he's being assumed that he's being a bad guy, and he's not a bad guy, which he's just trying to do the right thing. Hold on to the story because history repeats itself. But in the meantime, some other non-Jews to do some surprisingly, well, just surprising things. We have Hagar. Hagar gets a bad rap. But Hagar also did something that no one had ever done in the Torah until this point. And she is Sarai's and Sarah's uh, servant, maid, slave. And uh, they decide, oh, okay, you're going to go. Uh, Sarai's like, oh, go have a, a child with my husband because we can't have children. So she gets pregnant and Sarai is really, really mad about it. There's a lot of feelings and she kicks her out and she treats her badly and she beats her all these things. And so Hagar, Hagar, you know, runs away. And we have this little interlude when Hagar has run away from the uh, problems at home. Sydney, you're next on my list. My, I'm looking around in the lines here. Sorry. Sure. A messenger of God found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness. And she said to God, who spoke to her, you, God, are Elroy, by which she meant, have I not gone on seeing after I myself was seen? So... Uh, Hagar is out in the wilderness and a messenger of God, you're told first finds her and says, oh, you have to go back. It's going to be really hard, but you're going to be really like God loves you and you're going to go on to great things and your, your child is going to go on to great things. Um, and she so, feels so much better. And she then says to God, so now we know that a messenger of God is not really is true, it really is God's self. So Hagar says to God, with whom she's in conversation, so meta, there's a non-Jewish slave woman having a conversation with God in our Torah. Okay, back into the text. And what does she do? She gives God a name. A non-Jewish slave woman 
gives God a name. She names God El Roi, meaning like it's kind of short for, you know, like by what she meant. Like I, 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 I was seen, like you saw me, God, and now I can go on in my life and go on like, and I get to go on and see like you say, like, God, you saved my life. Like you saw me, you saw where I was in the dark, deep, dark place. And now because you saw me, you know how important it is to be seen. Now I can keep going. And so she names God El Rey. And no, 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 no Jew does that before her in the Torah. No man does that before her. No free person does that before her in the Torah. An enslaved non-Jewish woman gives God a name in our Torah. Pretty wild name. Remember that time that Abraham lied and said that uh, his wife was his sister? They don't learn. Jennifer, you're next to my line, sorry. Unless your men are all talking nonstop and being lazy. There is some talking going on here, so perhaps I'll relocate, but you can skip me this time. Okay. So, Leah, are you there? I don't know. Might be my hand. When the locals asked Isaac about his wife, he, oh, Leah, you're there. Yes. Would you like to read? The English or the Hebrew? Well, English? Hebrew, Hebrew seems faster. Or sorry, no Hebrew. English, English oh, seems really faster because we'll all just understand on the first right. go. The, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. When the locals asked Isaac about his wife, he said, she's my sister. For he was afraid to say my wife thinking the locals might kill me on account of Rebecca, for she's beautiful. When, when some time had passed, Avimelech, king of the Philistines, looking out of the window, saw Isaac being intimate with his wife, Rebecca. Avimelech sent for Isaac and said, so she is your wife? Why then did you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, because I thought I might lose my wife, my life on account of her, Avimelech said. What have you done to us? One of the men might have lain with your wife, and you would have brought a guilt, brought guilt upon us. Avimelech then ordered all the people, saying, "Anyone who is, who harasses this man or his wife shall be put to death." Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so familiar right like doesn't this seem like maybe maybe someone should have told a story of, hey I remember one time I lied and said that your mom was my sister uh -huh. which I hadn't done that because that non-Jewish pharaoh really showed me apparently no one told him this story or uh, or he wasn't listening because Isaac does the same thing because he also marries a looker and then lies and says, oh, she's my sister. And then Abimelech, who's, again, you're seeing him very parallel in the story. He's king of the Philistines. They look out the window and apparently Isaac and Rebecca were doing stuff in public they should have been doing in private. But they're in public and they're seen. And Abimelech is, again, insensitive. Why would you lie and say she's your sister? And I says, well, I thought I, thought I might, I thought I, I might lose my, lose my life on a of her, which really means I thought you might kill me I didn't trust you, you non-Jewish people. Uh, I'm surprised. I'm surprised that Abimelech is the name of a Philistine king. That's a Hebrew name. Yeah, the the commentators say it's really, and they kind of like do the word in medieval rabbi thing. They go, really, it was this ancient word, and they translate. So they they do the thing where they cock their head sideways and squint, and they make it into something else. But I hear you. It is very funny. They go Abimelech, which is already a name. Abimelech is also mad because he says the same thing basically the Pharaoh said like oh, it is it is a sin it is against the law in every religion you buy a woman fair and square she's your wife and if someone else has sex with her it's bad for everybody involved and Abimelech says like you know, we could have been all guilty bad things could have happened to us if one of us had sex with her wife because if she was just your sister who would have cared but she's your wife so that's like a whole other conversation that we're not going to have right now but it is interesting and Abimelech says, anyone who harasses this man or his wife will be put to death. Abimelech, I feel like is looking, like is looked at in the Torah as like, he is he's like Pharaoh, a stand-up guy. He's not Jewish. He's in a position of immense privilege because he's the king. He can kind of do whatever he wants, but he doesn't. 
he's being fair, he's being good, and he's being underestimated by our forefathers, frankly. Thoughts, any other thoughts? I know why um, King yes. Abu Melech has such relationship or affinity for Isaac already. It's so, no, no, no yeah, for sure. So there's a kind of, like, in the interest of keeping this within an hour, mm -hmm. is uh, I took out like all the supplements before and after, but Isaac basically traveled. He was, he was, he was traveling. He was just running around, he was walking around, digging wells, walked some more, dug some more wells. He dug a lot of wells, kind of always really known for, which is fine. Uh, and then God says, you got to stay there. And he's like, what? God's like, no, you got to stay there. You got to stay there and like raise a bunch of sheep. And he's like, okay. So he basically like becomes very integrated. He's definitely a minority in the community, but he can become very integrated in the community. So much so that later as time goes on, he builds immense wealth that this is well after this particular interlude, he, everyone gets really mad at him because they're like, that guy has that, that Jew has a lot of money and stuff. That happens later. So basically he was ordered to stay put and he did. Uh, so I want to show you a couple like kind of uh, Torah, Torah stories, folks in Torah to see that non-Jews, how they're kind of being portrayed. And next, I want to show you how our rabbis, our ancient rabbis kind of, not ancient, our, uh, our medieval rabbis and well, less ancient ones try to reinterpret some things. We talk about, um, if I asked you, what does Judaism say about marrying non-Jews? Traditional Judaism, classic Judaism, you say, like, oh, it says you can't do it, right? Like, yeah, no. Classical Judaism, you know, Jews can't marry non-Jews. Of course not, of course not. And a Jew is only a Jew if, if their mother's a Jew, right? Yeah, that, yeah, for sure. Every, that, that's in the Torah, right? Clearly, obviously. So let's talk about Joseph's non-Jewish wife. Uh, first, you can see it go down in Genesis, Liz. You're on deck for these, unless you're going to have a little jingle. Is there jingles when you? I swear I kept hearing like a, a ice cream. It sounded like an ice cream truck going by. Oh, there was an ice cream truck going oh, by. Oh, that was yeah. right. Oh, yeah, that's like muscle memory. Yeah, yeah. You, have, you may hear a train at some point. Oh, you hear trains here all the time. I think. I didn't even go anywhere. All right. Genesis. Tell us about this. Is this is the, you know, another, another, yet another pharaoh. A pharaoh. Some pharaoh. A escape no. Joseph, the name, okay. Zephanat Kinea, and he yeah. gave him for a wife, Adinat, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Um, thus Joseph emerged in charge of the land of Egypt. Okay, so we have in Genesis, we have Joseph, so you know, one of the many children of uh, Jacob. He, you know, we all know the story. We just had, you know, y'all, y'all, we all know the story more or less of Joseph. Point is, he's Jewish, very Jewish. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph is in there after that. And he, he interprets the dream seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, blah, blah, blah. Pharaoh loves him and changes his name and then gives him a wife. And his wife is named, named is Osnat. And the Torah says her, her, she is the daughter of Potiphera, a priest of On. So is she Jewish? Or is she, does she seem Jewish or does she seem not Jewish according to this Torah, according to the literal Torah? Isn't she Egyptian? She seems Egyptian. She seems uh, quite Egyptian. Mm -hmm. And then you have two, I want to show you just two different medieval rabbis and their commentary. So you have Rashi, who simply says, he says yeah, it says Potifera, but it really is Potifar. It's just like a weird different spelling. So Rashi, comes down the side of, oh yeah, Osnat isn't Jewish. Osnat, the wife of Joseph, like the mother of Ephraim and Manasseh, like tribes, like the tri like Joseph doesn't get his own tribe, but his sons do. So what you're saying is that there's a non-Jewish wife and that's a non-Jewish mother integrated very thoroughly into the 12 tribes Integrated every Jew that exists now. You want to use that genealogy? Fascinating. So there's that. But then I want to show you his Kuni, who's also a medieval guy. And he cites the Midrash, which are ancient rabbis. He's, he's citing rabbis for a thousand or so years before him to 
I want to show you a very great example of how the rabbis, both medieval and ancient, saw this. They saw this problem. It's like, well, oh my God, we, like the Torah, the Torah is saying Joseph married a non-Jewish woman and then had ostensibly non-Jewish children. And so they're trying to square that circle. And this is how Chizkuni, the commentator from uh, medieval commentator, and relying on Midrash, which is ancient, uh, tried to square that circle. Who would like to read this for me? It is a wild ride. Jennifer, can you talk or are you like still in man land? No, I changed rooms. All right. Potiphar only raised her. So she's uh, adopted, uh, adopted from. Okay. Uh, Pirke de Rabbi Eleazar explains that this was the daughter of Dina who had been raped by Shechem. Her grandfather Isaac, after her birth, had expelled her, placed a charm around her neck, and hid her among some prickly plants, so that when she found, when she was found, when found, she was named according to the location where she had been found. I don't know what that says. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Like sna, uh, as well as snot, sna, uh, uh-huh. Got it. The thorn bush. The angel Gabriel brought to brought her to Egypt, presented her to the wife of Potiphar, where she was raised. Jo- Joseph was paraded after his ascension to power, and all the young women of Egypt crowded around him to admire his being so handsome, and threw flowers at him. Osnat, who had no flowers, threw her charm at him. When Joseph took a look at the inscription on that charm, he realized that she was the daughter of his half-sister, Dina, and decided to marry her. Sorry, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. See, so like just, they just, he just, not, he just tied it with a bow. He sol- solved all the problems. What an amazing story that the rabbis and thus... Is that is convoluted. Mm-hmm. Like, no, no, no. They really, really, really want to make us not Jewish, which I think shows kind of their discomfort with having someone of the status in our... our religion of joseph have him married to a non-jewish woman because the tourist just says it and doesn't seem to care oh, Torah's like yep he married us not his daughter Ponti Clara. and his kuni is clearly uncomfortable with it and he cites midrash but the midrash is just this wild ride of like okay well dina we all know was raped by shem which like maybe she wasn't really but they like to think that she was raped so we're, they want to go with that so then and then they have this whole story like well isaac put a charm on her and stuck her under a bush. And then the angel, Gabrielle, took her and brought her to Egypt. Okay, but wait, could we keep with me here? And she was raised by Potiphar, okay, adoptive father. And then, okay, everyone was throwing flowers at this cute Jewish guy. And she threw her charm. She didn't have any flowers. And he realized, oh my God, she's like my half cousin. I'll marry her or something, our niece, I guess. And apparently that's much more palatable to... Um, the ancient rabbis and uh, Hiskuni, than him just being married to an angel. I, which I'm just, do you see like the, he's like bent over backwards and then like doubled over and crossed his arms and like looped through like, I just feel like a deep discomfort that not all of them have clearly, but that some of our rabbis, both medieval and ancient had with an idea that is very clearly and, and unrepentantly presented in Torah. But there wasn't enough women. I mean, the reality is there is no way that they could all marry, if they want to think about Jewish women. Right. Because well, like, 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 you look at like, uh, what happened to both, you know, Isaac and Jacob, how, how they found, they were, they're all, they were like blood relations. They were kind of like related through their mom. They're, they're kind of, they were reaching for it. But these, this is a woman who's not even like, because a lot of this tribal affiliation, right? So this is a woman who has no tribal affiliation, but will later become Jewish affiliation at all. But yeah, you're right. There's like there wasn't enough, there wasn't enough like related women for him to like go, which is I think also why the rabbis are really trying to make it happen. Because they really don't like the idea of what's it not in, what's endogamous, not endogamous marriage. When are you marry people who are not like related to you? The way all of the Ashkenazim are gross. Why we all have diseases. Uh, but that must be the only example, right? There would be like one, okay, there's like one example. So let's talk about Moses' non Jewish wife. Um, Sydney, tell us tell us some bits and pieces. I bet I like pull a little bit from Exodus from like a couple different chapters, but it makes sense when you put it together. Now, the priest of Midi- Midian? Midian. Midian had seven daughters. 
Moses consented to stay with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah as a wife. At a night encampment on the way, God encountered him and sought to kill him. So Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched his legs with it, saying, you are truly a bridegroom of blood to me. So there's a lot going on here. So you've got this, this line, you know Moses, Moses runs away, he kills a guy. Just think back to the Seder, you know, he kills a guy and the Egyptian guy and goes, ah, I killed a guy and he runs away. And he goes into the desert and there he, you know, if you've seen the Prince of Egypt, there's like all those, you know, singing and dancing and stuff. Love that movie. And he encounters at the well, all these daughters and there's people harassing them and harassing them. He gets them to go away. Wonderful. Oh, our savior. They bring him back to their dad and the dad at the priest of Midian. And we, which you know, is either written well slash Yitro or Jethro or Jether in the, was it the Ten Commandments? Terrible translation. And he says, okay, oh, you seem such a great guy. You saved by my daughters from being harassed. Marry one of them. Why don't you? And so Moses goes, I'll take that one. And he marries Sephora. It's a great name. My grandmother's Hebrew name. Love that name. So the Midianites are known not to be, they're not Jewish, they're not Jewish, they're not Jewish. So he marries Sephora, who is not Jewish. So that's like one level. And if you look down at the bottom, this is a commentator, he's like a, I think like 17th century, so like medieval, uh, I don't think it was medieval anymore, and Moroccan, who's interesting, or a Chaim. And he says the reason, if you look at that line, that first line, the priest of Midian had seven daughters. Moses consented to stay with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter to pour as a wife. Nor Hachaim says, why does it say Moses twice? Because the reason the Torah repeats Moses' name in this verse, when it could have simply written, he gave her to him. It's true. The Torah is a, you know, kind of the economy of words. It doesn't repeat words. You can either, either, either you believe that God wrote the Torah with a finger, or people have been working on it for a long time. But either way, there's not really going to be a lot of wasted there's things are in there for a reason they come from somewhere so why does it say moses twice now i'm also actually mentioned the kabbalist who's moroccan kabbalist cool combination and he said well it said it's because sephora was the divinely appointed wife of moses she was his bat zug bat zug it means like like your like life like life like you're your partner like partner the other half so sephora point of laura Haim, is not just like this random non-jewish woman who like gets you know thrown as a bone to to Moses she's his his soulmate this clearly non-Jewish woman but just to raise the ante just a little bit just a little more Moses going off he's doing his thing he's like I'm gonna go see all you know in Israel blah 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 Sephora's dad says okay get your kid slash kids not sure there at this point and let's go go join your husband so let's go so they're they're camping along the way and then suddenly and this, this is a weird, this is literally the entire story. It's like two lines. And it seems like it's dropped, probably it came from some other copy and got kind of dropped in there. But the point is, God's mad. We don't know why. And, but it just says God encountered him and sought to kill him. We don't know who him is. It's not specific here. So Zipporah realizes what the problem is. What is God mad about? It must be something to do with circumcision. And so Zipporah, the non-Jewish wife of Moses, takes a flint and she circumcises her son. So first of all, apparently women can be, mo you can be a mohelet, not just a mohel. So anyone who says like, but that's a man's job. I'm like, well, the Torah says you don't have to be a man to do it. So there's that. Uh, and also she's not Jewish and she saves his life, whether it's the son or Moses, we're not sure. Different scholars and rabbis have different interpretations. So mo Moses' wife, Zipporah, who also gets a name, very rare in the Torah that women never get names unless they're being victims. I mean, most of them are the victims and they don't get names. In her case, she actually has a first name, it's Sephora. And she saves either her son or Moses' life and she performs a circumcision. And her father, as a reminder, was very much so not Jewish. Questions, comments? Can you hear me? Yes. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Why, why was Sephora divinely appointed if she was not Jewish. I thought we're not into all that stuff. It's assimilation. So why was it? What happened? Well, I am very flattered. You think that I I know the, uh, the what what it is was God's mindset to appoint <laughs> Sephora as Moses' wife. Um, is it where I do not know? Why? But I know enough to know that the Orachim, who's a uh, 
fairly famous Moroccan Kabbalist and commentator felt that Zipporah was Moses' soulmate chosen by God. And I couldn't tell you why that is, but I open it up to your interpretations. I don't have a clue. I was hoping you'd have an explanation. <laughs> I mean, we don't want our children to date non-Jewish kids, right? So here you go. The Bible, it's, obviously God didn't mind. Not only did he not mind, he wanted it. I simply present information and you all can't wait from it. What you like. Mm, oh, Rafa, if you were for, here for my um, Judaism sex work class, she's familiar to you. But Rafa is. Is a, that Rahab Zona? Again. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, you know where we're going. So, Rafa, I think y'all were here for this, so I can go. I, I assume there is other than Jeffrey Slim is speaking it. But Rafa was a uh, not a Jew. She lived in um, uh, Jericho and Joshua, who's in charge now, Moses has passed away, and so Joshua is in charge, he knows we gotta go, we gotta take the city, and we don't just go marching into a city, that's ridiculous, so he has his spies go in, and the spies kind of uh, run into some soldiers, it's a problem, yeah, 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 and so they need to hide, and Rahab, who's a zona, a sex worker, uh, she hides them and she lies to the king's own soldiers. She's like, oh yeah, I mean, like a lot of guys are here, you know, like they come in and out, so I don't know. So, uh, so she lies and she she says, you know, like I know, like you're you guys are gonna win. I know that right is on your side, and I'm for you. And all I ask is that you spare my entire family. She doesn't even ask for anything for herself. This is in the book of Joshua. And then later we see after you know he tells the men like they're they're taking the city, they're sacking it, and. Uh, and Joshua said, bade the two men who spied on the land, go to the Zonah's house, bring out the woman, her, and all that belong to her, as you swore to her. So we're seeing book of Joshua, you keep your promises to non-Jews. And she and as a sex worker also. Only Rachel, Zonah, and her father's family were spared by Joshua, along with all that belonged to her. And she dwelt among this is the thing. And she dwelt among the Israelites, as is still the case. So she's still there in the book of Joshua. For she hid in the messengers that Joshua sent to spy out on Jericho. The rabbis in the Talmud, they see this and they just, they just, they love Rachel. They love her. And the whole, I don't remember the whole section they talk about. She's so good looking, just saying her name like turns you on. She's amazing. Everyone loves it. Rabbis love Rachel. And again, this little th weird thing with, sometimes the rabbis will look back into the text and will tort themselves and say like, oh, and really Osnath was Jewish. And you're like, Ugh. okay, that's an interesting way. But sometimes they curve the other and they're like, oh, well, you know. What else happens with Rahab at the bottom? They look at the Talmud. They have a problem, the rabbis. They say, well, eight prophets who are also priests descended from Rahab. How? And then they say, wait, hold on, hold on, but also Hulda, Hulda the prophetess, was one of them, was a, not one of them, one of them also descended from Rahab, but she also descended from Joshua. How is that possible? And they decide, well, it's possible because Rahab married Joshua. Like the Joshua, like the Joshua. So Joshua, the leader, the, the person who takes over from Moses, who merits to take over the leadership of the Jewish people from Moses. Joshua marries a sex worker who is a Jew by choice, and only in the because like, they can't, they, they the rabbis could not uh, buy Joshua marrying a non-Jew, but they do have him marry someone who converts to Judaism. Okay, they love so, Ruth, yes. Ruth is supposed to be the first convert, and she hasn't come into the story yet. So now she would actually be the first convert. I, almost I got the time mixed up, but timeline. Well, I mean, like, I think it depends on what, like, Ruth, I mean, Ruth, Ruth is in terms of, like, she's in Tanakh, she is, I think it's, it probably depends on how you're, how you count people. Because Rachav is, is it's, it's the rabbis in the Gemara already, like, reading back into it. Ah. So it's a, it's a timing thing. But it, it's interesting to kind of look at this and say, like, this is how they're trying. The rabbis are always trying to square the circle. But, well, what, well, this, you know, it's a kind of uh, like retcon. Well, retcon, she converted. It's okay. Everybody relax. Okay. So that, so up until this point, we've looked at primarily Torah and a little bit of Joshua, a little bit of uh, Nadim. And you see that. I hope that the the Torah 
is mixed. There are non-Jewish figures who do fantastic things, even who do fantastic things in the face of the Jewish people who we are rooting for doing eh, lots of great things. And you have our ancient and medieval rabbis looking at what's happening in Torah and reading back into it to either solve what they feel like are problems that the Torah presents, like, oh, Moses and Joseph and you know, people are marrying non-Jews all over the place over here, or they're trying to solve the problems, or they're venerating people for doing this. So I hope what you get from that is the Torah and Joshua are mixed. Everybody gets Shabbat. Every, every, everything on earth gets Shabbat. Shabbat is not just a special thing for Jews, it's for all people. And there's a very mixed kind of uh, feeling towards, it's complicated. Now we're gonna look at some laws. Ancient laws. This is looking at Gemara text. This is specifically actually, this is um, Mishnah. So it was, what's the term redacted? Like compiled and edited around the year 200. So it existed before then, but it was really kind of put together and written down around the year 200. And we've got all of these nice rules that the ancient rabbis have uh, about everything. And here specifically about non-Jews. I don't want to read this part out loud. Sure, I will. <laughs> Thanks, Sydney. It looks very spicy. It is fairly spicy. One may not keep an animal in the inns of non-Jews because they are suspected of bestiality. A woman may not seclude herself with them because they are suspected of engaging in a forbidden sexual relations. And any person may not seclude themselves with non-Jews because they are suspected of bloodshed. Okay, pause, sorry, pause. So mm -hmm. what are you, looking at this, what are the anxieties you're hearing, you're picking up from the ancient rabbis who were writing this? What are they worried about? What's their assumption? What are their concerns? Inappropriate social, uh, inappropriate sexual behavior. <laughs> yeah, they're worried of people. The rules about inappropriate sexual behaviors for Jews apply to whether you're doing them with anybody, Jews or not. They don't. They're worried about these forbidden sexual relations, usually people you're related to or sex in the period. Um, so yes, and sex with animals. What else? What is, what, are, what are their what are their anxieties or their you know the the stuff. violence of non-Jews, the bloodshed? Yes, they are They are afraid of, they're afraid of non-Jews. They are thinking, oh, you should never be alone with a non-Jew because they're violent. Okay, keep going. A Jewish woman may not deliver a non-Jewish woman because in doing so, she is delivering a child who will engage in idol worship. But one may allow a non-Jewish woman to deliver a Jewish woman. A Jewish woman may not nurse the child of a non-Jewish woman but one may allow a non-Jewish woman to nurse the child of a Jewish woman while on Jewish property. So thoughts about this paragraph. What are their concerns? Certainly not the, oh wait, I was gonna say uh, with Moses, he was, adopted by the pharaohs, but he was nursed by his actual mother. So I guess he wouldn't apply to this. He's still safe on this law. Yeah. So it's, it's a fear they're going to bring somebody into the world who is not going to worship Hashem. It's going to be an idol worship. So they have this concern about, we're, about perpetuating. So it's not like, oh, you need to go out and kill. We're not saying go out and kill the idol worshipers. We're not going to say that's not a Jewish imperative, but the rabbis don't want you to do anything even passively to passively increase the amount of idol worship in the world because idol worship is something that is forbidden to Jews. And if you're a Jewish person and you're increasing idol worship in the world, perhaps it's not that great a belief that, oh, you're indirectly engaging in idol worship because you're increasing idol worship in the world, even though you're not the one yourself doing it. But what do they allow? Considering they have this fear of non-Jewish people and because they are violent, what is there anything surprising about this? Because I was surprised by this. Well, it's, interesting. it's interesting that like we clearly the, the text doesn't want us really like helping our non-Jewish counterparts in a lot of these while also recognizing that like 
Jewish families may need help with like wet nurses that may need help delivering. So I don't know if that's due to us being like a minority or just kind of like the rules don't apply if we need the help, but we don't want to help others because of these holy laws. I mean, or it could be both. Mm -hmm. but, but two very good points. It's, so it's interesting that like, oh yeah, you, know, you can't be alone with them because like they're really violent. Oh, but unless you're like literally giving birth and extremely vulnerable and that's, you know, then, then it's fine. You can do you keeper. Technically, you're not alone because there's someone else there. It's just depending on the definition of a life. Uh, last paragraph. One may not have their hair cut by non-Jews due to the danger that the non-Jew will kill them with the razor, so says Rabbi Mayer. But the rabbis say, in a public street, it is permitted to have one's hair cut by a Gentile, just not when the Jew and Gentile are alone together. I took the word Gentile out of there because it's not really a good translation. And I got lazy. So <laughs> they mean non-Jew Gentiles. So you have a minority opinion presented first, which is unusual, saying, oh, you can't have your hair cut by a non-Jew because the non-Jew will obviously kill you with the razor. I don't think I've ever had, no, I guess when I lived in Israel, I assume that hairdresser was Jewish, but I don't think I've ever had, other than living in Israel, I don't think I've ever had my hair cut by a Jewish person. So, and I'm still here, but whatever. So you ever be mayor, the minority opinion saying, no, 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 you can never have a non-Jew cut your hair. And then the majority opinion, the majority of rabbis saying like, ah, I mean, like, as long as you're in public, like, they're not gonna try it. They're not gonna try anything in public, but there's still that undercurrent of there's, there's the mistrust. Though. And, and I'm not saying this to excuse it, but just simply to explain it. What was happening in the world where the Jews were living in the time of the Mishnah? So you have Jews who are, that have been, uh, the temple is destroyed and we're being forced into under a non-Jewish occupation, colonization, and so, like, would you be concerned about non-Jews? There's all these lists of rules, like, oh, you can't be, you can't walk around with, uh, you know, circumcision really being, you know, outlawed. And I knew you were Jewish. You had to have a knife for circumcision. You can't walk around with a knife for circumcision because then they'll know you're Jewish. So you have to hide it. And you can carry it, you know, like even on Shabbat because, which you can't carry anything on Shabbat. But you can carry it on Shabbat because you can't be seen with a knife for circumcision because then the non-Jewish authorities will kill you. So I'm not saying this to say like, oh, they're Xenophobia was ex is excusable, but something to explain perhaps where some of that anxiety was coming from. They had a very real fear of non-Jews because of their experience. But then sometimes our ancient rabbis really, really love non-Jews. And if you were there for our class on sex work, this is a familiar story. I think a lot of you were. Anyone want to read this one? It's a shortened version, shorter than the original. Liz, Jennifer, Leah. There was an incident involved. Yeah, I'm it. Okay. There was an incident involving a certain man who was diligent about the mitzvah of the sheep. This man heard that there was a zona in one of the cities overseas who took four hundred gold coins. Oh yeah, <laughs> as her payment. He sent her 400 gold coins and fixed a time to meet with her. She went up and sat naked on the top bed. And he too went up in order to sit naked facing her. As he climbed up to her, his four ritual fringes came and slapped him on his face. He dropped down and sat himself on the ground. And she also dropped down and sat on the ground. She said to him, I swear by the Gappa. 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 It's like, a, it's like a building, basically. Oh, okay. That I will not allow you to go until you tell me what defects you saw in me. He said to her, I swear by the temple that I never saw a woman as beautiful as you, but there is one mitzvah that Adonai our God commanded us, and it is to speak. So you've got this little yeshiva book, her little yeshiva boy. You heard this is very expensive. Very talented, I would assume. Sex worker, very overseas, 400 gold coins, which that sounds like a lot even by modern standards. He goes, he gets the money, he makes an appointment, a little calumly for sex work. And uh, he goes to the he goes here, she goes to the top bed, six, seven beds, and whatever. She's naked, it's her job. And he, as he's climbing up there, so excited to have sex with his amazing, talented sex worker, his seat seat, because he's so religious, smack him in the face. And he goes, What am I doing? This is crazy. And so he's like, in a lead, and she's shocked. 
remember this is a story being told in the Talmud. So this is a story told in by being told by rabbis to rabbis, pretty much four rabbis. They're talking to each other to themselves about themselves, and they're saying like, so you have this non-Jewish sex worker, very talented, probably pretty rich non-Jewish sex worker, as like kind of the uh, other character in the story they're telling. And she's saying like, how like what me like you're gonna you're going what did what what what's wrong and he says oh i never saw anyone who's good. you're fine everything's great but you know my seat seat remind me blah 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 i can't i can't be with you i cut that part out for the time so continue please she said to him i will not allow you to go until you tell me your name your city the name of your teacher and the name of the study hall in which you studied torah he wrote the information and placed it in her hand. She arose and divided all her property, giving one third as a tax bride to the government, one third to the poor, and she took one third with her in her possession. She came to the study hall of Rabbi Kia. Kia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And said to him, My teacher, instruct your students concerning me and have them make me a convert. Rabbi Kahia said to her, my daughter, perhaps you set your sights on one of the students, and that is why you want to convert. She took the note the student had given her from her hand and gave it to Rabbi Kahia. He said to her, go take possession of your purchase. Those bets that she had arranged for him in, in a prohibited fashion, she now arranged for him in a permitted fashion. Aw, Aww. Aww, kind of romantic, right? But there, it's, there's some interesting weird details to the story. So she she demands, as, as all non-Jews really understand and care about, like, oh, you little yeshiva boy, tell me the name of your teacher and the name of your study hall in which you study Torah. Yeah, it's a stretch, but sure, maybe she knew and she cared. So he writes that on this information, he gives it to her, and she takes all of her stuff, she divides it, she pays up, she does her due diligence to the government, either there's a tax or a bribe, it's not so clear. Uh, One third she donates, Remember, this is a story by rabbis, two rabbis, four rabbis, about rabbis. And that's what they're saying. This non-Jewish sex worker does. She pays off her debts and she takes care of the poor and she takes the rest of it with her. And she goes to the rabbi Chia and his, his yeshiva. And she says, okay, like I want to convert. And rabbi Chia says something really interesting, right? He says, like, maybe there's someone here that you really like and you uh, that's why you want to convert. And she says, yeah, this guy, this note. And what is this? He say, like, okay, go study. Okay, we're gonna convert you. Okay, let's go dunk you in the mikvah. No, what does he say to her? My favorite line. It's all right. Go take possession of your purchase. And that's how the story ends. There's no more like plot after that. So I'll leave that to you to think about what happened after that. Whether they got married or they didn't and whether she converted or she didn't. But you see the rabbis, and this isn't the rabbis commenting on something in the Torah, this is the rabbis telling a story in their own kind of milieu and then and commenting on it. There's, they have this story that they have about a non-Jewish woman, sex worker, who she's never painted poorly in the story. She's painted as someone who has, she's a good person. She, Takes, she's a good citizen. She pays off the government where she has to, either tax or a bribe. It's not really clear. She pays off, she, she takes care of the poor with equal gusto, one third, one third, one third. And also the threes is a really big Jewish number. I love that. And she just says, okay, this is, I do what I got to do. She shows the dedication and the love of us, which the rabbis really want you to do. But if you're not Jewish, they love when you're not Jewish and you love Jews. And, and she's also apparently really good looking. So that's kind of nice too. Maybe she had what they called a, a Jewish soul. So that's why. So I'll turn my fan off. I'll turn my fan off for you. Say it again. Oh, I said maybe it's what they call a Jewish. She has a Jewish soul. Well, there are those who say everyone who converts has a Jewish soul. They find their way back. So it's an interesting story that the rabbis tell about themselves, to themselves, about a non Jew who's never, she's not at all painted poorly, even, cons even considering the fact that she is a woman and a sex worker, so there's two kind of classes you would think are, oh, these are not uh, well-respected, and they're not generally, but the rabbis love her. 
what have you. I'm having some effects. Okay. These are things you might have heard of that are uh, Jewish hangups about non Jews, and it is, uh, these are real things. We're going to have Chalav Yisrael. We're going to have Cholav Yisrael. Chalav Yisrael. It comes to Jewish uh, rabbis' hangups about non Jews. It's mute. So, oh, Leah. Can, are you, yeah, are you volunteering you to read? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have a question about Rahav, her name. Oh, they, it, Rahav Hazona, that's how they refer to her. Mm -hmm. And Hazona, at one point, in one of the texts that we just read, she was a prostitute. But mm -hmm. that's not what I learned. I learned that Zona comes from the word Mazon because she was a storekeeper. She had a grocery store. Oh. Did you ever hear that before? It's a, it's a really nice whitewashing uh, <laughs> of Rachel. Well, because they, the, the text is not super clear that, it's clear that there are, uh, oh, there's a lot of foot traffic through her home. Yeah, right. Um, but, but Zona is very clearly used in Torah text to mean a sex worker. A, a what? A, to mean the prostitute. It means prostitute. Yeah, yeah. Someone who has sex for money. So, but I think that the the compulsion to say, oh no, Rahab was not, a, she wasn't a prostitute, she wasn't a sex worker, she was an innkeeper because we're going to interpret the word zona as literally something different than the Torah uses it as, I think comes to like the wanting to make her not a prostitute because we love her and we are trying to square that. But yes, I've heard that interpretation, but I think it's just- Oh, you did hear that? Okay. I've heard it, but it's, it's not accurate to the Torah's own definition of the word, which is very clearly someone who has sex work. I have another question, but it's about something that you already passed. Is this the time or you want to wait for the end? I want to wait for the end. So you're trying to okay, learn about what is Hall of Israel and why does it matter about Jews and non-Jews? It has everything to do with Jews and non-Jews. Um, so let's got, don't got milk. You don't want to got milk. But back from the Talmud, Rabbi Ishmael says to Rabbi Yeshua, for what reason do the sages prohibit the cheeses of non-Jews? Oh no. Rabbi Yeshua said to him, because non-Jews curdle the cheese with the stomach contents of unslaughtered animal carcass, and as that is not kosher, cheese is curdled with it is likewise prohibited. So there is definitely everyone like, why does this cheese not have a hexer on it? No kosher symbol. That's so stupid. It's just, it's just cheese. Well, because there are people who would say that you can't have any cheese that's made by non-Jews because maybe they're going to use um, rennet from unslaughtered animals or improperly slaughtered animals. The rabbis go on to, to talk about that because rennet, which is really traditionally how you make cheese. Sorry, Liz, you already know this. Is uh, Rennet is a lining of a calf's stomach and that's how you make cheese. Like it's all thick and, and delicious if you're really into cheese, I guess. And there is concern like, well, yes, dairy, not like meat, but non-Jews are going to use the animal parts to do that. So, vinat atum, or cheese made by non-Jews, uh, there are people who do not eat cheese made by non-Jews for this exact reason, because there's like concern that they're going to be making, they don't care about coach laws, not, nor should they, so that's what they're going to do. You also see at the bottom, Chal of Yisrael, right, famous one. This is the Shulchan Aruch, which seemed easier to use Shulchan Aruch, even though it's more modern. Milk that was milked, by non-Jews and no Jew saw them do it is forbidden as perhaps non-kosher milk was mixed in. Because you know, that just makes a lot of sense. Like people are milking their cows, but they're like, hey, I'm a little bit short today. Let's use dog milk or pig milk. All right, sure. The Shulchan Aruch goes on, if it was milked in his house and a Jew was sitting outside, if it's known that there's no non-kosher animals in his herd, it is permitted even if no Jew is able to see him at the time he milks the animal. So they're trying to make it workable. Kind of speak to Sydney's point of like, you know, when you're living, Jews and non-Jews are living together or near each other. And like, we're gonna never ever have milk from the herd of a non-Jewish person, even to the Shulchan Aruch time, like that's ridiculous. We're not gonna live like that. But they're still worried. Again, there's a, there's a concern here. Not that a non-Jew is going to kill you. So kind of rough being more, you know, 17th century. There's no concern that they're going to try and kill you. They're not concerned even as much about idol worship here. They're just concerned that they don't care about kosher laws, which they don't, because why should they? And that you might end up 
drinking milk that's coming from a non-kosher animal, which is not kosher. Or you might end up eating cheese that is thickened with rennet from a non-kosher or a improperly slaughtered animal. Is it gonna, that's, that's their concern. So that's, you're seeing that, that's the, I hope you hear that's the anxiety running through a lot of these kosher rules is that, well, they just don't keep kosher. Okay, is that the only thing they're concerned about? No, we're gonna make you real uncomfortable here real quick again. So, um, rabbis are really big on low carb. Pat Yisrael, or sometimes pronounced Pas Yisrael. Uh, Jennifer, could you read for us the Talmud? I can. Thank you. Once Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi went out to the field and a non-Jew brought before him a loaf of bread baked in a large baker's oven. Rabbi said, how exquisite is this loaf of bread? So what did the sages see that caused them to prohibit it? The Gemara asks, what did the sages see that caused them to prohibit it? It was prohibited due to the concern that Jews might befriend non-Jews while breaking bread with them, which could lead to marriage with non-Jews. <laughs> well, okay, so there it is. The other big anxiety that the rabbis have, besides that you might end up using this non-kosher, is intermarriage. <laughs> that's that's their big their big worry. You could have you could eat treif or you could marry a non-Jew, uh, which seem like very different concerns. Of, just very different concerns. And such a funny thing, thing like just the way the, the, the Gemara is written and talking to itself. You know, Rabbi Yehuda and in the field, and this friend I assume was a nice non Jew was like, oh, hey, I have this like, a delicious, would you like some? Uh, <laughs> I have this delicious loaf of bread. And he goes, oh, it was a beautiful loaf of bread. I thought the way about bread often. And the Gemara says, and then the, so the sages, what did the sages see that caused them to prohibit it? The Gemara says, what did the sages see that caused them to prohibit it? He's like, well, because. If a Jew and a non-Jew sit down and eat bread together, they could end up getting married. Um, but just to show you the anxiety that goes through a lot of Talmud and up until now, the concern is, oh, but they could end up marrying non-Jews. A lot of their anxiety is over Jews marrying non-Jews, breaking Jewish laws accidentally or purposely marrying a non-Jew. And they have a lot of anxiety over that. So what is Pasi Yisrael or Pati Yisrael? A Jew just has to have some involvement in the baking of the bread. So either a Jew puts the bread in the oven or a Jew turns on the oven or a Jew raises the temperature. A Jew basically has to touch something in the kitchen and then they're like, okay, we're going to do So if you ever see like what like plus Israel are so special, a Jew touched something in that kitchen at some point. And now imagine that you don't have to worry about their marriage anymore. Who knew? That was just like, that was a solution. Everyone could just relax. Just eat plus Israel bread. Okay. So combine all those concerns. Let's talk about wine, baby. Why would you ever boil wine? Excellent question. Uh, you should never boil wine. Um, who wants to read? Leah? Yeah. One minute. One once? One twice? One three times? So just as deriving benefit from their offering is prohibited, so too deriving benefit from their wine is prohibited. Non-Jews wine. Rav Ashi said cooked wine that is in a non-Jews possession does not require a seal within a seal for it to remain permitted for consumption by a Jew. If the concern is idolatrous libation, non-Jews do not offer us libations of cooked wine because it's gross. And if it is that a Gentile may secretly exchange the wine, their wine with the wine of the Jew, since there is one seal, the non-Jew would never exert themselves in forgery to, to facilitate the exchange. Wine has been used by lots of religions. I think it's still used by almost uh, many, if not most religions, use wine in some form or fashion, especially in pagan times. Where do you think we got it from? Uh, wine was used during pagan worship. Pour wine over. It really, like, literally, it was like you know, pour one out for the homies. Like you pour some, just a little bit of wine on the ground of every bottle you open. You pour a little bit into the ground. That's how like pagan people used to like drink wine. Like pour a little out to the ground, not for the homies, like for God, for gods, for Baal, for some pagan god. So of course, there's a lot of concerns. And Jews live near non-Jews, and you're like, maybe I want to buy their wine. What's wrong with their wine? Wine is wine is wine. I'm like, there's no meat in there. There's no dairy in there. What's the concern? I'm like, well, the problem is they can't drink, can you drink wine that is owned by or poured by non-Jews? They say, well, what's the concern? The concern is that it's been used for idol worship. That they have either taken the bottle of wine, they've gone like, oh, I consecrate this bottle of 
wine just looks like Tyrell. I've consecrated this bottle of wine for Baal, my favorite pagan god. I love him so much. This whole bottle of wine is for him, and I love him. And then you go into the Jews, because that's what non-Jews apparently concern themselves with. Like, yes, I want to give all these Jews some, some Baal wine. Sure. Or that you used it to like pour over their statues, and then whatever's left in the bottle is considered consecrated to that god. So, solution, apparently non-Jews knew what all of us know, which is that cooked wine is disgusting. So, they say, if you cook the wine, the non-Jews know that it's gross, and they would never offer it to their gods. So, that's the solution, guys. Non-Jews can handle your wine if it's in boiled, because it's so gross, they wouldn't want to use it for anything else. <laughs> and they would never, like, try and forge a different seal to be like, okay, maybe it would, because, like, no one cares. That's literally the answer to my question. So that's how you get this whole like, why does it have to be kosher wine? Oh, is it mavushal or mavushal? If you don't pronounce it properly, kosher wine is not mavushal and kosher aren't. You can't exchange those words for each other. Kosher wine, there's a certain way to make kosher wine. Red wine, you have to get the sediment and crap out of it, and you have to use things to fine it or make the crap settle. And they used to use in like pretty much never ever anymore, but they used to use like animal blood it was one of the ways they would do it because it would kind of cling to the pieces and it would fall. And then you'd have nice clear wine you could drink, and then like, animal blood obviously we can't do that. Also, spoiler basically, no one does it anymore. So that would be what makes your wine kosher, pretty much. Uh, but then there's the issue of, of non juice making your wine, touching your wine, pouring your wine. Um, so at the bottom, it sounds just some terms. So which means poured wine, that means it's been poured out for idolatry. You can never drink that period, boom, done. There's stam yenum, which is like wine that was like owned by a non-Jewish person. And then the rabbi is basically going, ah, too close. So it's the same thing as if it's been used for idolatry, even though literally the definition of stam yenum is that you never saw it being used for other worship, but like, just in case, we're not going to let you have it which later more progressive slash liberal authorities and you know, conservative uh, opinions or uh, Jewish law opinions said like, no, that's, come on. That's not, that's not nearly the same thing. And also no one does that anymore. Hold on to that. What does Mavushal mean? Mavushal literally means cooked. Levashal means to cook. Mavushal means cooked. Uh, has been cooked, has to, uh, but Rav Moshe, what, how, what it usually it used to literally mean like boiled. <laughs> Rav Moshe Feinstein, who's, who's uh, suck, who's, ruling is basically law in all of America is that 180 degrees for less than a minute. It has to be 180 degrees for less than a minute. I know, which is flash pasteurization. So it still makes it taste pretty much like trash, but uh, it's better than it was. And it's why people go, oh, kosher wine is gross. That's why people think kosher wine is gross because they, they, I mean, I think it used to actually all be gross. There's actually really good kosher wine. I mean, kosher is eating. There, I have had good Mugushal wine, but like only in Israel. <laughs> Uh, there is another way of doing it these days, which I just learned about. It's called flash detente, which is they don't boil the wine itself. They actually just take the grapes and they superheat them very quickly as soon as they're picked and they cool them very rapidly and they continue the winemaking process. So just, I just thought it was a fun fact. I thought you know yeah, that as they kind of, and it, it is considered mevushal, but it's definitely more new. It's a more modern, more new, newer way of, of doing it, which also results in the wine tasting less like garbage. Almost done. Yeah, we go. Okay. Uh, what do I do? Um, as it, the rabbis have to kind of reimagine what does it mean to be a non-Jew now. So you've got stuff like this piece from Kulin where you have Rav Nachman saying there's no such thing as heretics as you know these pagans, idol worshippers. They don't exist anymore among the nations of the world. The Gemara says, but don't we see that there are people who aren't Jewish? Because doesn't that imply that there's no more non-Jews? We know there's still non-Jews. The Gemara says, okay, but the majority of the people, of the nations of the world, they're not like idol worshippers, not pagans per se. We assume that the actions of some represent the actions of the majority. So we know that like we everyone we've ever met is not going around worshiping idols. Uh, so we assume that that's pretty much not done anymore. We don't, so if we assume if we see someone who's not Jewish, no one's, none of them are, are worshiping idols, which is a huge concern of it. And Rabbi Yochanan says the status of Gentiles outside of Israel is not that of idol worshippers, but their worship is not motivated by faith and devotion to idols. Rather, it's just a traditional custom of their ancestors that was transmitted to them. Whether this is true or not, I just want to point out, you've got the rabbis, even around the year 500, who are looking around saying, like, okay, 
we've been told we have all these prohibitions and all these restrictions we can do, we, we, we can't do because people are idol worshipers, idol worshipers. But, but we know there's no idol worshipers and we don't want to be concerned about idol worshipers. We don't think it's a problem to idol worshipers and we're concerned about idol worshipers. So how, so they try to like, they do the thing where they bend themselves backwards and contort themselves and cock their head sideways and squint real hard to say, how can we not toss out all of our texts and our laws and our traditions, but also say like, look, this is not reality for the world we live in. And they even kind of put that onto God. At the bottom there, Egyptian soldiers, that's a story, drowning in the Red Sea after pursuing the Israelites. And the same rabbis in the Gemara say the ministering angels, they wanted to sing their song to each other. They're so happy. And it, as it states, and it, they called out to one, each, one another, and they said, but the holy blessed one God sees all these angels who are so happy. Yay, the Jews are going free. And the rabbis in the Talmud put these words in God's mouth saying the work of my hands the egyptians are drowning at sea and you want to sing songs so the rabbis in the talmud putting the words in god's mouth of i'm not happy that there are non-jews dying i'm not happy that there are even egyptians we have a very checkered history with we just dealt with the whole issue with them slavery i'm not happy that they're dying i'm not happy that non jews are dying like how dare you celebrate that those are my children down there and i think it's really interesting that the rabbis are putting that onto the story of Pesach and specifically those words into specifically God's name. And ultimately, they are trying to always balance their fear of non-Jews because they have a very real fear of non-Jews and their fear of Jews becoming less Jewish, either because they're accidentally not keeping its vote or because they're worried, they're always concerned that if you marry a non-Jew, you're going to not care about Jewish Judaism anymore, which like is not a de facto thing. They have all these concerns, all these anxieties with also the fact that they just know that you cannot run away from other people and you cannot treat other people poorly. So you have things like the Tosefta, which is basically a proto Mishnah, saying in a city that has both Jews and non-Jews, so every city basically, those who will receive the communal fund, like tzedakah, should collect from both Jews and non-Jews because of the ways of peace. So should they distribute to the poor non-Jew and the poor Jew alike because of the ways of peace. One should eulogize and bury the deceased non-Jew and one should comfort and mourning non-Jew. So they're giving you all these rules of things you have to do for non-Jews, both emotional labor, eulogize and comfort, and also things that take physical strength and money, burying and distributing money. Gittin, a couple hundred years later in the Talmud, one does not protest against poor non-Jews who take the gleanings or pay out or all the bits and pieces of your fields you leave behind for uh, Jews to take, the, the rabbis say, okay, what if a non-Jew comes and takes the food from your field? And then the rabbis in the Talmud say, you don't, you don't stop non-Jews from, who need food from taking food. Why? Because of the ways of peace. Similarly, they teach one who one sustains the poor Jew, non-Jews along with the poor Jews, one visits sick non-Jews along with sick Jews, one buries dead non-Jews along with dead Jews. And all of this is done because of the ways of peace. Shalom, peace, then their ultimate goal, the rabbis want to reiterate over and over and over again, if you want to bring peace to the earth, you have to look out for and care about, this is both emotional weight and uh, physical and monetary labor, you have to care about Jews as, long, as well as non-Jews. They're all, the rabbis and our texts are always going to prioritize Jewish Jews over non-Jews. Jewish texts, Jewish leaders are going to, in, in, in our classic texts, are always going to prioritize Jews over non-Jews. They are. It's clear, but they also have this tension all the time of like, well, we can't treat them like trash, and we can't. On the one hand, we assume the worst, but we also want to assume the best, and it's just a constant tension. And so, I hope that that's that's what you get out of this. There's a lot of tension there. There always has been. So, if anyone says like, oh, these days it's so hard, well, it's always been. There's always been tension. So that makes it feel better. Uh, I hope so. I'm so sorry this ran really over, but we also started late. So my defense. Uh, so. I can take like two questions and then I got to run because one, I'm roasting and two, I have a babysitter. I've sent them. So thoughts, questions. I'll take questions first. And then pause. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe it's time you go home so you're not melting. <laughs> I mean, he likes to stay up late. But... This was really fun. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. To our second to last or last. <laughs> we haven't decided. Thank and you. I'd, I'd like to ask a quick question. Yes. All right. 
Uh, earlier in the session tonight, we spoke about not working on Shabbat, and that includes the non-Jews that live within you. So mm -hmm. where did the concept of Shabbos boy come from? Ah, well, that's just they're not working. That's easy. You simply say, wow, Mary, it's so hot in here. It's just, I'm just... I'm just sweating. I'm schwitzing. Wouldn't it be great if someone could just turn on an air conditioner? I don't know. It's literally how you do it. You're not making them work. How do you have hot coffee uh, in synagogue on Shabbat? Well, you can't tell them, hey, non-Jewish staff people, make us coffee because you can't make coffee on Shabbat, traditionally speaking. You can't cook on Shabbat. You can't boil on Shabbat. You can't make coffee on Shabbat. So how do we get away with it? Well, how we get away with it is that we say, oh, hey, who's in the kitchen? Is it, is it Sultanane or whoever is making coffee then? Say, hey, Sultanane, um, if you want coffee, you should just like make yourself coffee. And like, maybe like you wanna make yourself like 40 cups of coffee, like for yourself. That's literally how we, how we get around that. We say, well, Sultanane is making a cup of coffee for herself. It's one of our kitchen staff. Sultanane is making uh, 40 cups of coffee for herself and she'll just leave it in the social hall and whoever wants some can go get some, but it's her coffee. She made for her, not me. Yeah, Julie. Nice of her to share. And we all appreciate whenever the AC gets turned down and the coffee is made. And clearly you can work for money on Shabbat because, so that's just a misinterpretation. But good question. I love talking about Tashri Alaha. I'm melting. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you night. so much. Good to see y'all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.